scripture reading this morning is Hebrews chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. In your pew Bibles, that begins on page 1199. Hebrews 7, verses 1 through 10. Please follow along as I read. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham as he was returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham apportioned a tenth part of all the spoils, was first of all, by the translation of his name, king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, he remains a priest perpetually. Now observe how great this man was to whom Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tenth of the choicest spoils. And those indeed of the sons of Levi who received the priest's office have commandment in the law to collect a tenth from the people, that is, from their brethren, although these are descended from Abraham. But the one whose genealogy is not traced from them collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed the one who had the promises. But without any dispute, the lesser is blessed by the greater." In this case, mortal men receive tithes, but in that case, one receives them, of whom it is witnessed that he lives on. And, so to speak, through Abraham, even Levi, who received tithes, paid tithes, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. This is the word of the Lord. Let's remain standing. I heard about a a book this week uh, entitled... How to Survive Your Pastor's Sermon. Um, I, went on, I went to um, Amazon, and I looked at the book. I just looked at the cover, and the cover is a picture of all these very bewildered-looking people, just sort of staring, eyes glazed, um, looking you know, into this picture that was taken. You're assuming the pastor is speaking up on the stage, and um, all I can figure out is that pastor was talking about Hebrews chapter 7. <laughs> That's all I can figure out, um, because this is a very difficult chapter. In fact, before I started last Sunday, I asked in, I said, how do you make McKesseldick interesting? I said, it's not that I feel like I've got to make him relevant. I, he's already relevant. The Bible is already relevant. That is not the job of the pastor to make the Scripture relevant. The, the Spirit does that. But I don't want to make it boring either. Um, I want to do all I can to not let this become confusing to you because it's so very rich, uh, though it is a very... Um, difficult topic to cover. It's in the Scripture, so we're not going to skip it. I know I've read some pastors just skip this section because it's very Jewish. Um, But yet, it has a tremendous message in deepening our faith. You know, one of the reasons I don't think Paul wrote Hebrews is because the writer of of Hebrews spend so much time, started back in chapter 5, and then he comes to 7, and all the space given to Melchizedek. And if he's that important to the writer of Hebrews, and if that writer of Hebrews was Paul, you would have thought Paul would have said it somewhere else in the New Testament, but he doesn't. So I'm not saying that's firm proof of anything, but it does sort of make me think that it certainly was not on the mind of Paul to include Melchizedek in what he was writing because Melchizedek is of importance especially to the Jews because a priest, a priest is so important because you can't go to God on your own. You and I don't think like this, but to the Jews that would be so very important. You cannot go into the presence of God without a mediator. You need someone to represent you to God and someone to represent God to you. And so this whole idea of priesthood, when we hear it, we don't 
think a whole lot about it, but in the Jewish system, in Judaism, God designed it that way. In this tribe of Levi, these people would be set apart to represent the people before God and do all the things necessary so that the people... um, Well, they never really had true access to God, but at least do the things that would please God and as God's people. Um, So what the writer of Hebrews wants to show is that Jesus is our priest, our high priest. But that's a problem. That's a real problem. He is not a Levite. Jesus wasn't a Levite, tribe of Judah. Real problem. And any thinking Jew you said that to today would say that to you. He wasn't, in, was he a Levite? He, he can't be our high priest. He can't be the one that takes us to God because he's from the tribe of Judah. And so that's the mind that the writer of Hebrews has to deal with when he's writing Hebrews chapter 7. He's got to show them showing them that there's something that's rooted in history, rooted in biblical history, that shows that God, a long time ago, did something outside of Judaism. Something happened hundreds of years before Judaism even existed. And if God could do it back then, prior to Judaism, then God can do it again after Judaism fades away. See, that's the importance of this. And that's kind of, that's what's in the mind of this writer facing this Hebrew congregation who are being pulled to go back into Judaism. How do you answer that question? He wasn't a Levite. Oh no, he's greater than a Levitical priest, he's saying. He's of the order of a guy named Mechizedek. Turn to Genesis chapter 14. I had some confusion last week for some people. I just want to try to lay this out a little bit for you. I'm not going to be able to spend a whole lot of time on this. I want to look at the remaining six verses of these first ten this morning. But in Genesis 14, let me tell you what has happened before that. Creation, right? Chapters 1 And two, God created the world, everything in it. Chapter three, man falls. Sin enters the world. Chapter four, five, and six, you see the sinful world. You see a world that evil and continually, oh, there is a a godly remnant, but evil continually. God brings a flood, saves one family out of that flood. Noah's family, but God destroys the world by the time you get to Genesis 6 and and 7, and then God, through that family, begins to populate the earth again, Um, and then you come to the Tower of Babel. You remember that? That's how we got all the languages in the world. Everybody was trying to build a tower up to God. We're going to be like God. We're going to be there. We're going to get to God. And God confuses the world with languages, the Tower of Babel. And then you get, that's through chapter 11. Then then you get to chapter 12. And in chapter 12, God calls a pagan, uh, idol-worshiping man named Abraham, or Abram at that time. And he says, I'm going to bless you, Abram. I'm going to make you a great nation, Abram. I'm going to um, give you land, Abram. These are promises that God gave to him. And through you, Abram, all the nations of the world will be blessed. God gives him that promise. Abram goes to the land, and as he's coming into the land, he has with him a nephew named Lot. Nephew Nephew and uncle stay together for a while until they split ways. Uh, Lot goes and settles in an area known around Sodom, down in that area. Uh, Abraham goes in a different direction. Some kings 
decide to attack Sodom. And in the process of attacking Sodom, they take Lot hostage, among others. And they take all of these spoils of battle with them. They loot the place. Abraham hears about what has happened to his nephew. And he gets an alliance with some other kings. And they go to rescue Lot and all the other hostages. And they are successful. And as they are returning from battle, we come to the scene in Genesis chapter 14. As they're returning from that battle and having seen Lot rescued along with many others, we see this in verse 17, after his return from the defeat of Chandelumer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the valley of Shaveh. And notice verse 18, and Melchizedek, king of Salem, which is Jerusalem. There was, he was a king of a city-state in Canaan. He was a Canaanite king, but he was also, notice, a priest of the Most High God. This priest of the Most High God, Melchizedek, comes out to see Abram, and he blesses him. Notice in verse 20, and Abram gives him a tithe from the choicest spoils that he has just taken from battle. Okay, nothing else is said. Fades away. Turn in your Bibles to Psalm 110. 110. Now it's pretty amazing how in the land of Canaan, I don't, get, I don't know. I don't, this guy had no affiliation with Abraham. This guy is not a Jewish king. He is a Canaanite king. Understand that. Uh, there's nothing we're told about how God reaches this Melchizedek and brings him to be a priest to the Most High God. There's no understanding. Nothing is told to us about that. The only observation we can make is God was doing something in somebody else's life besides just Abraham. That's all we can assume, right? He's a priest to the Most High God, and he lives in Canaan. How he does all that, I don't even know. That's, that was an evil place. Now we come to Psalm 110. 1,000 years later, Back in Genesis 14, there was no Judaism. Understand that. Judaism did not exist yet. Abraham was not even a Jew yet. Melchizedek was not a Jew. There was no Judaism. That does not come for 400 years. When I come to Psalm 110, Judaism does exist. David is the king, in fact, of Israel. There are Levitical priests in operation. There is a high priest within the Jewish religion at this time. This is 1,000 years later. David, in Psalm 110, is meditating on the fact that this Messiah that is to come, this is called a royal psalm. This is a psalm about the Messiah, this um, and David is meditating, no doubt, on this, this truth as he writes this in Psalm 110. Notice what he says about the Messiah. The Messiah is going to, notice in verse 1, he is going to be deity. The Lord says to my Lord, first person of the Trinity, says to the second person of the Trinity, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Verse 2, the Lord will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion. You're going to rule from Jerusalem. That's another word for Jerusalem is Zion. Saying, rule in the midst of your enemies. In other words, Messiah is going to be a king. Then notice in verse 4, the Messiah, still talking about the Messiah, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Nothing has been said about Melchizedek for a thousand years. 
And David says this about him in relation to the Messiah. You are going to be a king and you are going to be a priest. And you're not going to be a priest according to the Levites, Aaron, and all those guys. You are going to be a priest according to this guy way back in history, Mekeseldek. In other words, Mekeseldek is a type of this Messiah who is to come, who will also be a priest and a king. Then we move forward another thousand years. Nothing else said about Mekeseldek, and we come to Hebrews chapter 7. Turn there. Starting, actually, he introduces it in verse 20 of chapter 6, as I told you last week. It says, talking about behind the veil, Christ, our high priest, has gone behind the veil. He has gone into the presence of God for us. Verse 20, Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us. What does that mean? One day we'll get to go there because he went there. We have access because he has access behind the veil. Having become, notice, a high priest forever according to the order of Mekeseldek. And he actually started back in chapter 5 talking about him, but this is how chapter 7 is set up. Then notice he says some things about Mekeseldek in verses 1, 2, 3, all the way through this chapter. So the writer of Hebrews is meditating, 1,000 years after it's written, meditating on Psalm 110. And thinking about this Messiah that has come, this Jesus that has come, speaking to this Jewish congregation realizing if he's going to show these Jews in this congregation why they should not go back into Judaism, why Jesus is legitimate as a priest, as a legitimate as our high priest, the one who can take us to God, then he's going to have to explain how it's possible that Jesus, who is not a Levite, because only they could be priests, He needs to set forth some biblical and historical account to show that Jesus, though not from the Levitical priesthood, rather is from another biblical priesthood, the order of Melchizedek. God at one time in history, the writer of Hebrews is saying, God at one time in history operated outside of Judaism. You follow that? Outside of Judaism. And it's way back there in Genesis 14. David acknowledges it. Outside of Aaron. Because this Christ is the order of is a priest of a different order, the order of Melchizedek. I said to you last week to understand this the best, and the best way to see this is to understand it as type, a typology. The Bible uses types. The Bible uses Old Testament pictures, Old Testament illustrations, Old Testament events to prefigure or to illustrate a New Testament truth about the person and work of Christ. Melchizedek is a type of Christ. Christ is the antitype. An antitype is the fulfillment of a type. Write that down somewhere. That's what Christ is. Melchizedek was a picture. Um, I told you last week when the scepter, the bronze serpent was lifted up in the wilderness to heal the people. That was a picture, Jesus says in John 3. So shall the Son of Man be lifted up. I told you in the Old Testament, you had sacrificial lambs. 
Those were a type. Christ, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. The fulfillment of all those pictures of lambs being slain is Christ. And then I showed you in verses 1 through 3, these these different characteristics are mentioned. You see in verse 1, he is called a, uh, Melchizedek was a priest and he was a king. In Psalm 110, the Messiah is a priest and a king. That's not normal, by the way. Kings were not priests and priests were not kings in the Levitical system. But this order it is. Melchizedek was. And he pictures Christ. Um, the reason I say to people, you cannot take Jesus as your Savior and not your Lord. Come on. He's a king. He has the right to take you to God and the right to rule over those he takes to God. He is Lord and Savior. He is king. You embrace him, you are embracing a king. A new boss. You cannot divide up that office. Secondly, I told you last time, notice in verse 2, his mere name points to Christ. He is righteousness and he is peace. That's what his name means. King of Salem, Shalom, peace. Mekeseldik, righteousness. Jesus came to give us righteousness. My greatest need and my greatest problem is I'm unholy and unrighteous and separated from God. I need righteousness. Jesus came to bring righteousness. Why? So that we could have peace with God. We are at war with God. The question you must ask yourself, are you at war with God? If you're at war with God, it's because you are not righteous and you cannot come up with your own righteousness. Only Jesus can provide that righteousness. So his mere name points to that reality. He brings righteousness. That righteousness can be imputed to you by faith in what he has done, that you can be at peace with God. Colossians 1.20, having made peace through the blood of his cross. I'm not talking about feelings of peace. I'm talking about the war between us and God. Jesus comes and makes peace as a peace offering between us and God. Thirdly, I showed you that he does not have a genealogy presented in Scripture. This is very confusing. I understand this. Verse 3, without father, without mother, without genealogy. This confuses people. I understand that. The point is this. Scripture does not record it. It is by divine design that this man be presented as a type. Therefore, the Spirit of God has omitted a genealogy for this man. Why? To show that he, heredity is, he does not have the Levitical heritage, to show that he does not have the qualifications of the Levitical priesthood. His priesthood is by divine appointment. It's, it's, it's interesting. Everybody else in the book of Genesis has a genealogy. That's what the book is about, genealogies. There is no recorded genealogy of this man because he is a picture of Christ because he does not fulfill the priesthood by heredity. He's not from the line of the Levites. I really believe that is the point. All he is saying, he's not saying this man did not have a mother or father. He simply is not one recorded because he's a type. He points to Christ. He has the same qualification to be a priest that Christ has. He's appointed by God. And finally, he has a never-ending priesthood. There's no record either of his death in the Bible. Once again, picturing the eternal priesthood of Christ. Does it mean he did not die? He did die. He was a man. He was a historical figure, and he did die. But God kept his death out of the scriptures. Why? Because he's a picture. That's all the writer is saying. He's a picture. They all died. The Levitical priest died. He did not die. Notice in verse 4 of chapter 7, now he's going to give us some other um, 
ways that Melchizedek is superior to the Levitical priest. Follow closely on this. Notice verse 4. Now observe, look closely, he says, look closely. If you, went, saw that in, if you saw that in the Hebrews 14 passage, how great this man was to whom Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tenth of the choicest spoils. Abraham, he's saying, gave a tithe, gave a tenth of the best spoils of war to Melchizedek. Remember, he was returning. He sees Melchizedek. Melchizedek blesses him, and he gives him these tenth of all the spoils. Now, that may not be significant to us, except that Abraham is a big deal to the Jews. Abraham was a great man. There was probably none greater than Abraham, except the writer is saying, Melchizedek is greater. That's what he's saying. In the mind of the Jews, Abraham is a patriarch. In fact, sometimes when God wants to identify himself, he calls himself the God of Abraham. Abraham is a great man, a key figure in Judaism. But even this patriarch, this verse 4 says that, even this patriarch, even this great man whom all these promises were given to, he gave a tithe to Melchizedek. He, um, of the choicest of the spoils, he gave to Melchizedek. Point is, if Melchizedek is a type of Christ, and Melchizedek is greater than Abraham, then Christ is greater. That's the point he's making. Christ is greater. That's what the book of Hebrews is about. Jesus Christ is better than, greater than everything Jewish. This is proof, he's saying. Abraham, that great patriarch of Judaism, gave a tithe to Melchizedek, recognizing that Melchizedek is greater than Abraham. Look at verse 5. And those indeed of the sons of Levi who received the priest's office have commandment in the law to collect a tenth from the people, that is, from their brethren, although these are descended from Abraham. Okay, what is all that saying? According to the Old Testament, Levites were not given land. Remember, Levi was a son of a great-grandson of Abraham. You have Isaac, then you have Jacob, and then you have the 12 sons of Jacob, and one of those sons was Levi. And all the other sons got land. But the sons of Levi, they were appointed to be a priestly tribe. They didn't get land. They weren't apportioned land, but they could receive tithes from the people. That's what this verse is saying. The law allowed that. They were in charge of the religious community. They led in worship. And the law commanded those who qualified in Levi's line in the house of Aaron, they were allowed to collect tithes, that verse says, from their Jewish brethren. See that? From their brethren. They could collect a tenth. That's what it's saying. So what you have there is Jewish brethren, by law, paying tithes to Jewish brethren. But in Abraham's case, his tithe to Melchizedek was different. His tithe, one, was not under the law. There was no law about tithing. That was within Judaism. This gift, this tithe was a free will offering to Melchizedek. And it was for a tribute to the greatness of Melchizedek, not that he saw him as being equal. It was a voluntary offering. He recognized that this man was superior, is the point that he's making here. In fact, if you see that later in verse um, you see that later in verse 7, but I'll get to that in just a moment. But do you understand that? Do you see the point that is being made there? It's given as a tribute to the greatness of Melchizedek. So if Abraham gives this 
tithe, gives this voluntary gift to Mechizedek. And Mechizedek is a picture of Christ. I mean, there's lessons there for us in regards to our giving, right? Remember, this is not law. Nowhere do you see Abraham ever doing this again. Nowhere is Abraham ever called a tither. This is all preceding 400 years before the Jewish law, which instituted this whole law of tithing. So this is a free will gift from voluntary from Abraham to Melchizedek. I think that principle carries down to us even. Um, I think that we should freely give to God. Um, Not out of some legal requirement, uh, but we should do it out of a motivation of love, adoration, recognizing the greatness and the glory of our God. I don't think you could look at this. I've heard some people take this passage and say we should all be tithing because of what this passage says. I don't think that's the teaching of this at all. In fact, I don't think when you get the New Testament, there's any law about tithing to Christians at all. I believe that was something that was in Judaism. Uh, You had, in fact, three tithes in Judaism. Uh, they didn't just give 10%, they gave 30%. I mean, it was a tithe, you, you had church, and, not church, but you had uh, the religious the theocracy, you had the religious and the, the social and political all together. And they gave 30% to support all of that. And so when you get to the New Testament, the principle of giving is really more in line of what you see Abraham doing, a voluntary giving to one who he deems worthy. Um, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 16 just for a moment. I get sidetracked here. This is a good topic to get sidetracked on, by the way. Um, this is how the New Testament says that. I, I don't think it's wrong to say I want to give 10%. That's not wrong, okay? That's not wrong. Um, but We're to give. That's the point. We're to give. Look in verse 1. It says in verse 16 of chapter, no, verse 1 of chapter 16 of 1 Corinthians, talking to a very poor group of people, talking to them about collection for the saints in Jerusalem who are going through uh, poverty as well. He says, now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so do you also. Verse 2, on the first day of every week, each one of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper so that no collections be made when I come. Notice he says, put aside and save. Put aside, uh, in other words, give. In this point here is don't do the collections when I get there, but I already have them collected so I can just take them and return, return to Jerusalem with them. But his principle is this, as he may prosper. And put aside and save as he may prosper. As God prospers you, he is saying, um, give. Randy Alcorn says in his book, The Treasure Principle, he says, God doesn't prosper me to raise my standard of living, but to raise my standard of giving. We should be givers, folks. Listen, we live in a world of takers, okay? We live in a world of takers. It's, I want, give me, do this for me. We live in that kind of society. Go to 2 Corinthians verse 9, verse 6. Now this I say in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. Now this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one, verse 7, must do just as he has purposed in his heart. See that? No percentages, no law here. It's from your heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. See, it's the response of the believer 
to God. It's the heart behind the gift. That's the point. And see, I believe Abraham's example of that, of a voluntarily free will giving to Mekeseldek this type of Christ. I think that's the picture for us there. Um, he gave to Mekeseldek. Um, to God does not have any needs. God owns everything. And he lets us be stewards uh, or money managers. Uh, and, and the purpose is to provide for our own needs. And sometimes he lets us see how, he just he, he lets us see how we're going to use the rest for ourselves or for his glory. See, there's nothing evil about money. It's the love of money that captures the heart many times. It's the covetousness and the greed. And we're to be generous. And giving, and I mean, the, he gave 10%. The, 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 one of the kings, back in Genesis 14, the king of Sodom says, oh, take it for yourself. Take these spoils for yourself. He says later in that passage, he says, no. No. I'm giving it all back to you. And he gave the tenth of the choicest spoils to Mekeseldek. That was the hard attitude. I'm not attached to these things. That's what you're saying. So... We're by nature just very self-serving people. And I think the greatest attack on our, on our selfishness is to give and to give generously. And 10% is fine, but for some people, 10% is not sacrificial. And you can you live with percentages if you want. That's fine. But why limit yourself, right? Um. One more verse I like to look at on that is a verse, well, I'll just quote this one. Acts 20, 35, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Um, what you give away brings greater blessing to you. Luke 6, 38, give and it will be given to you. They will pour out into your lap a good measure. The picture here is a, a woman who would go to the marketplace and to buy grain and she'd open her apron and say, put all the grain in here. And that's what he says he will do. They will pour into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, when you give, he says, and running over. For by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. Anyway, I, I, I just think that's the picture of this giving of this tithe to Mekeseldek, who is a picture of Christ, is a picture for us in giving. Go to, uh, verse, back to Hebrews chapter 7. Verse 6 of Hebrews chapter 7. The second thing that Mekeseldik does is blesses Abraham. Okay, so you have Abraham giving a tithe to Mekeseldik. Now you have Mekeseldik blessing Abraham. And this is what the writer says. But the one whose genealogy is not traced from them, not traced from the Levites, collected a tenth from Abraham... And bless the one who had the promises. See, we don't think much about this blessing idea. Um, uh, it, it really doesn't register to us. Sometimes we use the word very loosely. Someone sneezes, we say, bless you, whatever that has to do with sneezing. We don't really know, but the point is, it just says it's a nice thing to say. Or blessings on you. Or I'm so blessed. You know, we, we throw those words around and we don't really know exactly what we're saying when we say that. It's sort of a mindless thing to say at times. But in the context of Scripture, when blessings were made on people, oh man, this is, this is the idea of, of not hoping something happens. This is not idea of wishing something would happen for you. This is the idea of this is what's going to happen. It was someone who stood in the place of God and spoke with authority when they gave you a blessing. And that's why it was such a big deal for Isaac when he blessed uh, Jacob, and Esau got all upset. I want the blessing, I want the blessing, but he had sold his birthright, as you, if you recall the story. Joseph blessed his sons. Uh, you see these blessings. These were um, the whole idea that someone would, could make a pronouncement on you with authority. And so 
Mechizedek blesses Abraham. And um, Abraham, who had the promises, that verse says, is blessed by Mechizedek. And so what's he saying? Don't lose sight of this now. It's not Mechizedek that's so great. It's Christ who's so great. That's the message here. We're not really talking about Ms. Keseldeck, as much as we're talking about Christ, because he's a type of Christ. Christians can get caught up in superstars, can't we? Superstars. Everybody wants to go see somebody. Here's, but listen, don't let every, anybody ever get between you and Christ. Ever. Go to verse 7. He just sums it up this way. I mentioned this earlier. But without any dispute, the lesser is blessed by the greater. Pointing to the fact, <laughs> if, if Abraham gave tithes to this man, Mechizedek, and if Abraham is blessed by this man, then this man is greater than Abraham. And anything that ever came from Abraham. Notice the third thing, verse 8. This uh, Mechizedek's priestly order lives on. Verse 8, in this case, mortal men receive tithes. That's talking about the Levitical priest. But in that case, one receives them of whom it is witness that he lives on. Once again, I go back to the point that there was no recorded death for Mechizedek recorded in the Bible. The scripture is silent on his death because he is a picture of Christ. But in the Levitical priesthood, that was the problem. They died. They would die. And in their death, and in their death, something is going off in here. <laughs> and in their death, um, And their death, that's why they could never deal with sin. It was not permanent. They would die. Look at verse 23 of chapter 7, down at the bottom. 23 of chapter 7. The former priest, on the one hand, existed in greater numbers because they were prevented by death from continuing. You need lots of them. But Jesus, on the other hand, because he continues forever, holds his priesthood permanently. You see, that's the picture. Yes, Mechizedek died, but he's not portrayed in Scripture as having ever died because he is a picture, an illustration of Christ. Therefore, he is able, verse 25 says, to save forever those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. And then finally, Levi, now this is interesting, verse 9 and 10. Levi gave tithes to Mechizedek. Okay, wait a second. Mechizedek is in chapter 14. Levi doesn't show up until a couple generations later. He's a grandson, great-grandson of Abraham. So how in the world does he say that Levi paid tithes to Mechizedek? Keep in mind, he's trying to show that the order of Mechizedek is greater than the order of the Levitical priest. And here he says, Levi paid tithes to Mechizedek. And so to speak, through Abraham, even Levi, who received tithes, notice this, paid tithes, for he was still in the loins of his father when Mechizedek met him. See how this author is arguing this point? In a sense, he says, so to speak, in a sense, Levi paid tithes to Mechizedek because when Abraham gave those tithes to Mechizedek, Levi was still in the loins of Abraham, even though he wasn't born yet. Because, you got to understand this, folks, the Jews and the Bible views things corporately. Follow this. Views things corporately. The ancestor contained it all. The ancestor represents all the people, all his descendants. The promises to Abraham affect all his descendants. Abraham acted on behalf of all his descendants. 
what one person does, this is the Jewish mind, this is also, you're going to see how the Bible looks at things, the, well, what one person does affects his descendants. Abraham tithing, Levi and Aaron were also tithing Mechizedek. You don't have to turn there, we're out of time, but 1 Corinthians 15, 22, listen to this, listen to this. For as in Adam, all what? Die, right? Sin entered the world through one man, right? Corporate, right? One person affecting all his descendants. The rest of that verse says, so also in Christ, all will be made alive. See, corporate, same idea. Jesus Christ acted on our behalf. The progeny is affected by what the one Abraham did. His point, Mechizedek, is greater because the lesser tithes the greater. Why would you want, Jews in this congregation, why would you want to go back to Levi? Why would you going to want to go back to the Levitical system when there is a much greater priest who is not according to that order, but who is according to a greater order, the order of Mechizedek. Christians, Christians, what can you get from this passage today? One, you can get, pay attention to the details of God's word, right? Didn't that say that to you? I mean, this is so, this is so obscure. Much, so much not said. We see, meditate on these details. Pay attention to God's word. I think the whole book of Hebrews is probably about Psalm 110. I think that's probably what the whole book is. I've heard several commentators say that along the way, and now I'm convinced of it. So we've come to this. See, our, our goal of our life is to know Christ better. If this, this should help me know Christ better, this should show me how a sovereign God has worked things out from way back in Abraham's day, a thousand years later and a thousand years later. Don't neglect the Old Testament. You know, all the books before Matthew, that's the Old Testament. Don't neglect it. Don't neglect it. There's much in there that's certainly not for us to apply in our lives today as Christians, but there's so much rooted, deep theology that feeds our understanding of who Christ is because Christ is the focal point of all of Scripture. And then I say this, that's why I just consider his greatness and worship him. That's what we do. Giving is worship. Giving sacrificially is worship. Giving, anytime you say no to you and yes to him and give and trust him, that is worshiping him. And we owe him our very best. And if you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, I want to tell you something. You need a priest. You need a priest. You cannot go to God on your own. You need not a human priest. You need a high priest, the perfect high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our high priest, eternal high priest, permanent high priest. You need him. You see, you are a sinner, and you are condemned to an eternal hell. You will face the wrath of God if you die in your sin. But Christ, Christ came into the world to pay the penalty of that sin to take the wrath of God for you, that you might have his righteousness imputed to you by faith in what he has done. If you're not a Christian, I encourage you to embrace Christ, the priest king, the one who can take you to God 
You put your trust in him, the one who can give you righteousness and peace with God. That's our invitation to you this morning. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for this day. We do thank you for these truths. They're so magnificent. We thank you, God, for helping us in our understanding and guiding us through these things. Father, we ask you to continue to help us to know Christ better and to worship him and glorify him, to make him known. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.